Dr. Brown serves as the Managing Director for Measurement at the Door Institute for New Leaders here at Rice University. For those of you who might not be aware of this um, institute here on campus, it's committed to ensuring that the services it provides to students are of the highest quality and achieve the greatest impact on the development of Rice, uh, Rice students as leaders. And Dr. Brown oversees all of the me measurement initiatives to this end. He regularly consults with organizations on ways to measure their impact on people, including nonprofits, churches, and schools. Uh, before Dr. Brown came uh, back to Rice, because he is also a Rice alum, as is his wife, uh, he worked as the L.J. Simmons Presidential Professor of Psychology at the University of Oklahoma, where he taught and conducted research for over 16 years and established the Institute for the Study of Human Flourishing. So with that, let's please welcome Dr. Brown. Thank you for that. It is such a pleasure to be with you all today. Can you, would you raise your hand in the back if you can hear me okay? Is that good? Okay, great. I sometimes can be a shouter when I get really excited, but that in this sort of a space, maybe that's not such a bad thing. Uh, before I begin my presentation today, I, I wanted to get to know my audience just a little bit on, on a very simple dimension. So raise your hand if you don't mind. If you grew up or spent uh, a lot of your formative years here in Texas, raise your hand. Ah, well, that's, that's great. Um, so uh, next, raise your hand if you grew up either in Texas or any of the states in red on this map. See how many? OK, so that's almost everybody. I've, I've got a few, a few outliers here. That's great. So if you raised your hand, uh, this talk is for you. In, in fact, this talk is kind of about you, in a way. It's about me, too, uh, because it's about culture, and it's about a particular dimension of culture that is prevalent uh, in these red states that you see on the map behind me, and in various parts of the world, uh, many parts of the world, in fact. Um, now, if you didn't raise your hand, this talk is still for you. Um, I hope if you grew up in one of the, the red states, or in another culture that shares some of the, the same cultural foundations, that you'll get uh, some personal insights out of this. You'll understand yourself a little bit better. If, if you didn't grow up in one of these states or in a, a similar culture around the world, maybe you'll understand your spouse a little bit better, or your in-laws, perhaps. Or maybe just you'll understand the city of Houston or the state of Texas a little bit better. Uh, and, and that could be good. It could, in fact, even potentially save your life one day. Uh, so what I'm going to do in this talk today is talk to you about, uh, broadly, what we call a culture of honor. There are a lot of different flavors of honor cultures around the world throughout history, and I'm going to focus most of this conversation uh, on the, the way in which honor culture works here in the United States. So we'll, we'll stay pretty close to home. Uh, we will begin talking about cultural anthropology and some history, ancient history and some more modern history. And that'll sort of set the stage for the second part of the talk in which I'm going to delve into research on honor culture dynamics here in the United States, focusing on the ways in which um, the culture of honor can relate to well-being, broadly speaking. So let's get started. What is a culture of honor? When, when you use the word honor in everyday parlance, you might mean something like virtue or character. These are perfectly valid uses of the term honor. But if you're a social scientist, that's really not what you mean. If you're a social scientist and you're talking about honor or honor cultures, what you really mean is something like reputation or the right to precedence or earned respect. So honor cultures around the world put the defense and maintenance of reputation at the heart of social life. They make in a sense, everything about social life about defending or maintaining your honor. Now, there's a really key word here, and I've highlighted it in red. It's the word earned. So in an honor culture, your value as a person has to be earned. And something that can be earned can, first of all, not be earned. It doesn't have to be earned, but, it, but you hope that, it, that you will. You'll earn this. But once you earn it, you can also lose it which is really, really important. It sets up a lot of the, the psychology of honor that we see in honor cultures. You, if you live in an honor culture, you orient your life around earning honor, 
around earning a certain kind of reputation and then defending it at all, at all times, and, and perhaps at all costs. Because if you lose your reputation, if you lose your honor, if you are dishonored, you might not ever be able to get it back. Or it might take extreme measures to do so that could perhaps put your life at risk. So it's important to be vigilant. It's important to be careful. It's, it's important to do everything you can to make sure that you not only earn honor, but keep it at all times. Now, what kind of reputation do you want to have in an honor culture? I'm glad you asked. It depends upon whether you are a man or a woman. So for men living in an honor culture, the kind of reputation that you want is a reputation for being strong and tough and brave and utterly intolerant of disrespect. Do not disrespect a man in an honor culture if you know it's good for you. For women, it's a little different. The kind of reputation that you want to build, maintain, and defend, there may be elements of toughness in, uh, in the desired reputation for a woman living in an honor culture, depending on which honor culture it is. But the primary ingredients for a woman, the kind of reputation that she wants to have, is that of being sexually pure and loyal. And a woman's reputation along these lines is intimately bound up with the reputations of the men in her honor circle, her husband, her father, her brothers, her cousins, right? So you can see that these, these things are, are intimately connected and very important. So, so what it means to be a real man in an honor culture is defined in these ways. What it means to be a good woman in an honor culture is defined in these ways. Now, if I were to ask you, gentlemen, sitting here, are you a real man? What comes to mind for you? Uh, is the first thought that comes to your mind, is he asking if I'm a virtual person? Is he asking if I'm a figment of his imagination? Right? Is this an existential question? I'm guessing that the answer to that is no. You know what I mean, don't you? And if somebody comes up to you and challenges this reality, this desired reality that you're a real man, what do you do? What's the first thing that comes to your mind? Is it, well, I'll engage in an existential dialogue. I think, therefore, I am. Or look, prick me and I bleed, right? No, that's not really what it is. It's more like, I'm about to prick you and see if you bleed, right? <laughs> it's a challenge, isn't it? It's take off your coat, step outside. We'll find out if I'm a real man or not. We'll find out if you're a real man. So we're going to come back to that dynamic shortly uh, when I talk about what the consequences of these sort of honor dynamics are around the world and here in the United States. But more broadly, I'm gonna make an argument to you. I think my head is blocking the way here. I'm gonna make an argument to you, an assertion that's not particularly controversial among social scientists and cultural anthropologists, and it's that most human beings that have ever lived have lived in an honor culture, defined basically the way I defined it just a moment ago. It's actually only in a relatively recent period of time that some people have diverted from living in an honor culture to living in a face culture, which is more or less an honor culture with social hierarchy appended to it. Or even more recently, in what we might call a dignity culture. Now, there's a, several important ways in which dignity cultures differ from honor cultures, but the main way, I would argue, goes back to that word earned earned respect. In an honor culture, you have to live up to these particular masculine or feminine ideals that the culture defines for you in order for you to be a, considered a person of worth, to have value, social value. In a dignity culture, that's not nearly as true. In a dignity culture, you are afforded a certain level of value as a person because you are a person. And this is a very modern idea. This is what probably a lot of us kind of have in our brains today, but if you'd lived 200 years ago, 300 years ago, no matter where you lived in the world, you really wouldn't have that as, as an assumption. Th that would be a very strange idea to you, and it is kind of a strange idea in the history of the human species. It's a fairly modern invention. It is prototypical of what we uh, think of as dignity cultures. Not that, that a degree of respect can't be earned or lost if you live in a dignity culture. Uh, people in these cultures recognize the difference between someone who's nice and kind or somebody who's competent, somebody who's brave, someone who is able versus unable. 
right? There are degrees of respectability even in a dignity culture, but there's also a certain level that you can't drop below in terms of having worth or value as a human being because you are a human being, okay? So that's the main disting distinction. There are others, but th that's the main one. So where in the world do we see dignity cultures, face cultures, and honor cultures? Primarily, and this is of course on a continuum, so it's not simple categories here, but primarily we're talking about dignity cultures being in Northern Europe, Scandinavia, and Canada. Face cultures primarily being found in Southeast Asia. And, and I would argue prototypical honor cultures throughout the Middle East, um, Northern Africa, really all around the Mediterranean, and, and to a degree, the entire rest of the world. So if it's not circled here, you can basically assume that to some extent, you're talking about honor cultures, even today. That's especially true in the past, but even today that's true. Uh, a few examples of honor cultures. You can think of honor cultures at a broad level, uh, sort of thinking about the world map. You can also think about honor subcultures, right? Gangs or maybe the Italian mafia are good examples of honor-oriented subcultures. Right? What's the one thing you want to make sure and not do to Don Corleone? Do not disrespect him, right? Uh, that's also true of your, your basic prototypical inner city gang member. Do not show disrespect. Um, you also see this at the societal level all around the Middle East and the Mediterranean, North and South Mediterranean, uh, throughout Central and South America, and in the Southern and Western United States. Not to the same degree that you do in Sicily or Saudi Arabia or Afghanistan, but still to an important degree among certain groups. Right. Uh, to understand why that is, we need to understand this guy, Mel Gibson. No, not Mel Gibson. The guy that he's representing here in the movie Braveheart, I'm sure many of you have seen that. Uh, he's playing the role of uh, William Wallace, who was a real historical figure in southern Scotland uh, around, around 1200, who helped to lead the, the Scots uh, in a rebellion against the English. Um, so. This here, circled in red, is Scotland, basically the size of South Carolina. And William Wallace and, and his compatriots were mostly in this, uh, this yellow area here uh, in southern Scotland around Edinburgh, Glasgow uh, today. Um, so these southern Scots really incubated and almost turned into an art form, this idea of honor and honor-related dynamics. Um, they were constantly being invaded from the south by the English counter-invaded from the north by the Highlanders. Uh, they'd never really had a stable, strong system of government that protected them from the English or from raiders to the north. And that's the, exactly the right kind of environment in which to incubate and cultivate an honor culture. What do you have? If you don't have much economically, and they didn't, they were basically sheep herders and goat herders, and if they were really lucky, cattle herders. They don't have much economically, and what little they have can be stolen from them overnight, right? If, you're, if, you're, if you have an, ag uh, not an agriculture, a, a pastoral economy, you're a herder, basically. Um, people can, can take your, your herd at night, and, and, and then you have nothing, right? You're going to die, your family's going to die, and there's nobody to get it back, right? You can't call 911, you can't call the police, there's no stable king who's going to come and protect you, so what do you do? You develop a reputation as someone who should not be trifled with. You and your extended kinship network are all there is, all that separates you from certain death or almost certain death, right? So you want to make sure to have this kind of a reputation as someone who's tough and strong and brave and will not tolerate even a small act of disrespect, because if you do, then that sends a signal that you can be disrespected, that you can be treated lightly, disregarded, and maybe we'll just take your stuff. What are you going to do about it, right? So, so it's the perfect environment in which to develop an honor culture. And these Southern Scots did that uh, to a great extent for many, many years, for many, many generations. And then under King James, remember King James of the King James Bible, he was himself a Scot in origin. And he had this great idea as, as an English king when he took the throne of England after Elizabeth. He said, I know what I can do to deal with the Irish problem. This is a constant problem for English kings. So to deal with the Irish problem, I'm going to give free land in Northern Ireland right here to the Scots as long as they agree to move with their entire families and basically settle there. And they will help me to subdue this big island of Ireland. You can imagine how well that went over with the Irish, 
right? Because it wasn't free land, it was their land. They essentially got kicked out of it in favor of these obnoxious, unruly, kind of barbaric, pugnacious Southern Scots. There were others that King James sent there too, people that he didn't particularly like in England, a few, a few uh, um, nobles and, and other upstarts, but basically they were sent there to try to help subdue the Irish. And they did so more or less for about 100 years, but after a lot of massacres and political unrest and some famines, they decided, okay, this is for the birds, this is not going so well, let's, let's go. And they did, they went to the colonies, they went to the Americas. So basically, this guy settled with his family in tow, very unusual for immigrants crossing the Atlantic at that time. They didn't come mostly with families, it was mostly single men that came. But the Scots, or Scotch-Irish, as they were often referred to, because they often came from Northern Ireland, they weren't Irish, but they, but they were called the Scotch-Irish, they came and settled most, mostly in what was then called the back country, right? not in the settled towns along the coast, but in the back country as sort of a human shield between the towns and settlements and the natives. In fact, the, the Puritans, uh, or rather the Quakers who ran Pennsylvania, they were pacifists, right, theologically, and so they couldn't have a, a standing army. Uh, there was no sort of civil force um, that they could use to protect themselves, so they gave free land in western Pennsylvania to these pugnacious Scotch-Irish to essentially protect them, the Quakers, from the Indians. That didn't go all that well. Uh, they started more fights than they solved, but that was the idea. They thought it was a good idea, learning from King James and his failed experiment. So basically, Oh, pointing the wrong way. Basically, this guy settled the Appalachians with his family. They, they went south, and then from there, they went west and became this guy. <laughs> right? If you ever wondered why in old classic westerns, everybody's named McDougal and McPherson, and, uh, this is why. Because there was a heavy influence of, of these southern Scots who settled the southwest. In fact, at the time of the first U.S. census around 1790, these Southern Scots made up about 10% of the entire U.S. European population, okay? But in these, in these red states, not all the way to the west, but certainly around the Appalachians and the Carolinas, down into Georgia, in some places they made up over 50% of the immigrant population. And they brought all these honor-related norms and values with them wherever they went. And they effectively outbred everybody else. Can I say outbred and immigrants in the same sentence? These are my people, so I think I'm allowed. But they, they really did that. And they, they brought sort of like a dominant social gene. They brought these honor-related norms and values with them. Men must be strong and brave and tough and intolerant of disrespect. And women must be loyal and, and, and sexually pure to be a real man and a good woman. I constantly, when I give talks, I bring notes like I'm going to look at them, and I never do, and then I get behind, like, where am I now? What am I talking about? Okay, so when social scientists do research on uh, honor cultures and honor-related dynamics, they do it at a national level, sort of categorizing nations. Um, I lost my picture there. Categorizing nations as more or less honor-oriented, more dignity-oriented, more face-oriented. Um, researchers in the United States will do this at the state level, more or less using the Census Bureau designation of North as relatively uh, dignity-oriented, and South and West, with a couple of exceptions, as being more or less honor-oriented, at least among Caucasians. Um, but then they also do it at the individual level, and more directly measure the extent to which people, men and women, endorse, believe in these honor-related values that are oriented toward the definitions of masculinity and femininity, what it means to be a real man, what it means to be a good woman. So the research I'm gonna to talk to you about today basically takes that approach. One of these approaches of categorizing people from different nations or different parts of the US or directly measuring their endorsement of honor-related beliefs and values to see what these things predict. Now, this is kind of ancient history. Well, it literally is all of ancient history and some more modern history Right? And you might think, but is that really how people still operate today? <laughs> to an extent, no, not completely, not the way that they used to, but to an extent, yes. So even, even though a lot of the basic social reasons that, that honor cultures develop and thrive are gone here in the US, there's 
I grew up in Alabama, not a lot of sheep herders in my family, not a lot of herders of anything. I grew up in a fairly wealthy area, so you might think, well, this, these sorts of dynamics are gone. They're really not because they're rooted in definitions of masculinity and femininity that we still teach our children, that we still sing about in our music, that, that still show up in a variety of ways in our stories, in our, in our sort of social myths and narratives. So they are alive and well, and I hope to convince you of that today, and you can still study them. How do you do that? Well, you can do it in the laboratory, for one thing. Um, <clears throat> some of my most favorite studies in all of social psychology, that's my background, I'm a social psychologist, some of my most favorite studies of all time uh, were done looking at honor-related dynamics in the laboratory. Some of the earliest ones were done at the University of Michigan. So these are all done with fairly well-educated, mostly middle-class college students. And what the researchers did was bring them into their laboratory, and they first found out, are you from the south, one of these red states, or are you from the north? Where did you grow up and get your definition of masculinity from? And they brought these college guys into the laboratory one by one and set them up to be insulted in one condition or not insulted in another. Now just imagine being in this study, if you will. So you show up down in the basement of the psychology building all by yourself, and you have to walk down this long, narrow hallway. And it's already narrow, but it's been lined on either side with chairs. So it's, you could do it, but it's kind of a tight fit. There's not a lot of room on either side. You're heading down this hallway. You're looking at, I'm just looking for room 101, right? That's where I'm supposed to be for this psychology experiment. And it's at the end of the hall. And to get to the end of the hall, you have to pass by a guy who's, who's got a big file cabinet open. And he seems to be kind of desperately looking for a file. He's thumbing very carefully through a very densely packed file drawer. And for you to get past him, he has to stop what he's doing, shut the file drawer, and get out of your way. Because you can't both be in that same space. So you get nearer and nearer to him. He sees that you're coming. You see that he sees. He sees that you see that he sees. Right? And he's acknowledging you. And he, at the last minute, he basically slams his drawer closed and gets out of your way. He's kind of ticked off. Right? But he does it. lets you pass by. You go into this room, room, room 100, right? And you, you, you meet an experimenter. And the experimenter says, great, I'm Bob. Thanks for showing up today. Uh, I'm going to have you do a, a packet of questionnaires, fairly straightforwardly. Uh, you can't do it in here. You need to head back down the hall <laughs> to another room, room 105. You can sit there. Here's, here's a pen. When you're finished, come and get me. Right? Let me know that you're done. And that'll, that'll be the whole experiment today. So you head back on out. And there's your, there's your old friend back at his file drawer problem. Right? Again, he sees you coming. This time he's really mad because you stopped him again, slams the drawer closed, and calls you an impolite name, we'll say. Right? I'm being recorded, so my mother might hear this. I'm not going to repeat what he said, but it's fairly insulting, to say the least. He slams the drawer closed, storms into his office, and closes the door. Kind of throws a little fit, essentially. You're standing there kind of like, what just happened, right? This is not my fault, but this guy really insulted me in one condition of the study. In the other condition, none of this interaction with the guy in the file drawer happens, and you just go about your merry way, going up and down this hallway. So now you're walking to the room. If you're in the insult condition, you've been kind of stunned by this unfair insult. You feel a certain threat to your masculinity, or do you? It turned out that you do if you grew up in the South, in one of these red states. If you grew up in the north, in one of the yellow states that I showed you on the map earlier, you find the whole thing a little bit humorous, frankly. And we know that you did because the researchers were secretly videotaping people. <laughs> so they could see you were smiling or you were frowning. They kind of got the um, initial emotional reaction. But the really fun part comes where at the, uh, at the end of the hallway, you get to the room. You're filling out questionnaires, and the researchers are measuring a variety of things about you, some of which I'm not going to go into. But they actually come back down the hall and take a little saliva sample from you. In the middle of filling out all these questionnaires, you spit into a little tube, and they take your spit away, and they analyze it. And what they're looking for are your hormone levels. And it turns out that the guys who were from the South, if they were in the insult condition, they showed spikes in their testosterone and their cortisol levels. Testosterone is basically a social status hormone, a, a social competition hormone. Cortisol is a stress hormone. And both of these are spiking in the southern males who've been insulted. Not in the southern males who were not insulted. They were basically just like the northern males. But if they were insulted, 
these southern males, their, their testosterone is spiking, their cortisol is, rising, is spiking, they're stressed out, they feel threatened. Based on the questionnaires that they filled out in the little packet, researchers knew they were also thinking about masculinity threats. And here's, here's my most favorite part of this. You finish, you finish your little packet of questionnaires, you're heading back down the hallway, and now, walking toward you is a very large man. He was, in fact, a linebacker on the college football team there at the University of Michigan. So he's a big guy. Now remember, remember the context. You're walking down a narrow hallway. It's been made extra narrow by chairs lined, lined along both sides of it. What are you going to do? Well, it depends. Where are you from? And were you insulted? If you were a southern male, southern born, you're walking down this hallway, and you were not previously insulted, you were extremely polite to this fellow. You basically said very, very early on, oh, please, after you, and you sort of squished yourself up on a chair to let him pass, because you're a polite southern gentleman. If you were a, a polite southern gentleman in the insult condition, you went toe-to-toe -to -toe with this guy, because what is this? It's a game of chicken, right? You know how to play that game. Your masculinity's been threatened. You gotta show that even though the laws of physics still apply and two objects cannot occupy the same space at the same time, you're not scared of this guy. You're basically doing this without actually doing this. And the researchers, again, were measuring, they measured the physical distance between your feet when you finally turned and gave way. And everybody did, because they had to, right? But you went as close as you could possibly get to this guy, right? I'm not scared of you. You had to prove that you were still a real man. None of that was true for the men who grew up in the North. Again, they thought the whole thing was kind of funny, right? Southern men did not think it was funny at all, right? It was like you just told a joke about my mother, and now we have to step outside. So there's a number of studies like this done in the laboratory under control conditions. Of course, the guy at the, at the uh, file cabinet was working with the experimenters. The football player was working with the experimenters. It was all contrived to be in this controlled environment set up to designed to see how people would respond based upon where they're from and whether or not their honor had been threatened. Remember, this is important. If their honor hadn't been threatened, if there was no honor-related trigger, the southern males were perfectly nice. They weren't aggressive. They weren't mean. They were, in fact, excessively polite. They gave way much earlier. Other studies, they show firmer handshakes after, after uh, an honor threat by men who grew up in an honor culture. Again, just doing all these things to demonstrate you're a real man. You're tough. You're strong. You're brave. Don't take me lightly. Um, other studies subsequent to this show, uh, for example, men in an honor culture uh, and women, to an extent, too, place greater value on loyalty to your group. This is actually one of the brighter spots in the literature on honor. There's a couple more. Most of it gets pretty dark pretty quickly. Um, for example, research shows that uh, among people, observers from an honor culture, when they see or read about or interact with a woman who's, who's been emotionally or physically abused by her romantic partner, as long as that abuse is somehow linked to her partner's honor, right? So it's jealousy-based in some way. He feels his honor's been threatened. As long as there's some honor link, that woman is respected more by observers from an honor culture if she sticks with him, if she stands by her man, right? You can see a connection between these two last points, right? So we value loyalty to your group. We respect a woman who stands by her man, even if he's abusing her. Um, you can see the conceptual connection between these two things. I actually experienced a connection between these personally <clears throat> about 25 years ago. I'm already getting choked up. It's not that kind of a story, actually. It's just the chicken. Um, so about 25 years ago in San Antonio, I was, I was having lunch at a Tex-Mex restaurant called The Patio with a man whose daughter I wanted to marry. So it was one of those lunches. He was having a really good time. I was not. In, in the middle of this lunch, he, he leaned over and he asked me if he'd ever told me about his cousin Lily. Of course, he had not. It was kind of a setup. So I said, no, tell me about your cousin Lily. And he said, Lily was a beautiful woman, still is. She never knew a Friday night alone, if you know what I mean. And I wasn't sure if I was supposed to say that I knew what he meant, right? <laughs> so like, I felt like this was a trap. So I just sort of nodded politely. And he went on to say, she eventually married a guy that... I didn't like very much. And uh, one night I got a call that Lily had been put in the hospital by this guy. He'd broken her jaw and broken her arm. So I made some other phone calls and called some other guys in the family. And we showed up with our baseball bats 
and put her husband in the hospital. And he never did it again. And I'm sitting there thinking, what <laughs> is the point of this story in this particular context? And basically the point of the story was, you take care of my daughter, or I've still got my baseball bat in the back of the truck. It was awesome. And the interesting thing about this, and the reason I tell you the story now, is that I sort of resonated with it, right? Because I grew up in Alabama, an honor-oriented male, and I thought, yeah, you know, if somebody was doing that to my sister or my cousin, I've got a baseball bat too, and I'd make a few phone calls and I'd be there. It was a very uncomfortable realization in that particular context, but I wasn't thrown off by the story. Okay? It, was, it, it seemed perfectly natural to me that this would happen. Uh, all right, so what else do we see in research on honor cultures outside of the laboratory? Outside of the laboratory, you can do more dramatic things. You can look at more extreme outcomes than you can inside of a laboratory. Uh, so for example, you can look at homicide rates. It's very difficult to do homicide studies in a laboratory. But outside of that, you can look at homicide rates. We got close in one study. Um, what, what you find is higher rates of argument-related homicide uh, in honor-oriented states among certain groups um, and, and exacerbated in certain areas. So it's important that it's, it's argument-related homicides, first of all, um, because these are the kinds that start with, what'd you just call me? Are you looking at me? Right? What did you just say about my sister? It starts with a, usually a trivial altercation that is elevated, right? You have to one-up each other, and then somebody ends up in the parking lot dead. And that's the pattern that you see elevated in honor states. You see that especially in, more, in, in cities that have been rated as very polite. It's called the paradox of politeness. So just like we saw in the laboratory, the southern males, oh, please, after you, as long as they haven't been insulted, as long as their honor has not been threatened. Once you cross that line, the gloves come off, and we shoot you. You only see these regional differences, by the way, among white males for those historical reasons. It's not that you don't see honor dynamics in other groups, in non-white groups. It's just you don't see it regionally distributed in, in this pa the pattern you see on this map among non-white groups. It, it follows this history of the, of the Scotch-Irish. These patterns are elevated in smaller communities. Right? This is what we call the small town effect. Why? Isn't that where people don't lock their doors and everybody knows everybody? Well, yeah, but the problem is in a small town, everybody knows your name and everybody knows your shame, right? Your reputation is even more important when everybody knows who you are, and that's why you see uh, an, an, a magnification of these sorts of patterns in smaller towns. Uh, I'm going to go kind of quickly because I got my, my time cued to me a moment ago. Um, you see elevated rates of school shootings. In fact, there are three times more prototypical school shootings in honor states versus in dignity states in the US. You see higher rates of domestic homicide, again, among white males. And this even goes back to the level uh, of, of the, the high school years. We see uh, higher rates of teen dating violence going all the way back to the ninth grade in honor states versus dignity states among whites. It's not all about beating other people up, though. It's also about, again, showing that you're strong and brave and tough. You don't need a seatbelt or a helmet, or oh, I don't need to pay attention to that sign that says drive slowly and carefully. Um, so you actually see a higher rate of accidental deaths uh, in honor states versus dignity states. It also shows that small town effect that we see with homicides. Now, very quickly, this, I was supposed to get to this about 10 minutes ago, so I'm sorry, I'm going, uh, I went a little too slow before. Um, my, my colleagues and I were wondering if there might be a link between honor and suicide. And that might seem strange because you think suicide might seem to be a sign of weakness, right? Um, so why would there be a link to honor? Well, to, to understand that, you first have to understand the general dynamics of suicide. Now, I'm going to talk about this in a fairly dispassionate kind of clinical way, acknowledging that I bet a number of you in this room have been touched by this topic of suicide at some point, as I have. So it's, it is a very personal one, a very meaningful one, but I'm going to try to be kind of dispassionate about it, if I may. So what we know from research on suicide is that there are a couple of key ingredients. First of all, the ability to harm the self, which is not natural. It's counter to our basic instincts. It, it is an ability that must be acquired through experiences of pain and essentially practice, which is why you see uh, people attempting suicide in small ways, cutting and doing other things to, uh, to harm themselves, they are essentially working up to the ability 
to uh, more seriously harm themselves. But besides ability, you also have to have the motivation. Fortunately, most of us don't have that motivation. The key ingredients in that motivation are, number one, feeling like you are a burden on others, and number two, feeling socially disconnected. You can connect all of these ingredients, in fact, to honor cultures. The ability to harm the self, demonstrated or built up through experiences of pain and suffering, and even, even playing football and full contact sports where you really just get the crap beat out of you all the time as, as a matter of course. Or on the flip side, access to guns, which makes the ability to harm the self relatively quick and painless. And you see, in fact, greater access to guns in honor states versus dignity states. On the motivational side, think about constantly living with the fear of being dishonored. You might not be fully conscious of it. You don't necessarily wake up as, as a male in, in an honor culture every day thinking, well, maybe today is the day. But there's a certain part of you that is always a little bit worried about that. Because remember, if you lose your honor in an honor culture, you might not ever get it back. And that has severe implications for your life, it has severe ramifications. And the more extreme honor cultures it can mean um, social shunning, you never get a job, you never get married. So it's a pretty big deal. And if you experience dishonor and you feel like you can never get your honor back, well, then you're likely to feel like you're a burden on your loved ones. They might feel the same way, in fact, especially in more extreme honor cultures. And failing to live up to these standards of honor that your culture is, has given to you, has dictated for you, you might feel socially disconnected. So for all these reasons, we thought maybe there would be a connection between honor and suicide, even here in the United States, which is not an extreme honor culture, even in the South and West. So we looked at suicide rates. Uh, at a state-by-state -state level over a period of almost 10 years, what we found, to get uh, to cut to the chase, is elevated suicide rates, primarily at a regional level among whites. Unlike what you see with homicide, we found this for men and for women. And, and to give you a sense of how elevated we're talking about, ranging from 37% to 64% higher in honor states versus dignity states, again, evidence for the small town effect. People living in non-metropolitan areas if they're in honor states, seeing an elevation that was even higher than, than the norm for people living in metropolitan areas. And these differences, as with all differences when we're looking at state-by-state -state comparisons, include statistical controls for poverty and education and religiosity and even things like access to hospitals and access to guns, which we know is, in fact, higher in honor states. Now, this graph, and I'm going to wrap up pretty quickly here, this is one of the most uh, profound graphs that I've ever put together from data in any of my research uh, ever. Uh, this this uh, captures suicide rates as a function of age and whether uh, you're a, a white male living in an honor state or a dignity state. And what you see is at every level, starting back in the teen years, at every level there is a separation between these lines. The red line is honor states, the blue line is dignity states. And that line gets, th those lines get wider and wider apart as you get older. And it becomes exponentially increasing in its, in its distance, in its growth uh, in the older years. All right? We actually have a, a study ongoing among older men in the US right now uh, to try to understand this a little bit better and to understand what's going on. Again, this, this pattern that you see here holds independent of economic factors and religiosity and all kinds of things that you can measure at the state level. To try to understand how we get to that extreme point, uh, my colleagues and I years ago decided to look at mental health care. Uh, we found, first of all, that people who individually, who endorse the beliefs and values of an honor culture about real masculinity or good femininity, uh, reported greater social and personal concerns about just the idea of seeking help for mental health needs. Again, a mental health need sort of feels like a sign of weakness, and we, we absolutely hate weakness in an honor culture. We hate it in ourselves, we hate it in others, uh, and, and, and you see this not, not just at the social level, what will other people think, but even at a personal level, what will I think about myself if I have to see a doctor for depression or anxiety or for some other kind of mental health need? Even worse, we found from a study using data from, from the CDC with about 90,000 participants in this particular study that parents in honor states, even when they acknowledged that their child had a mental health need, they were less likely to take that child to seek help. That was not true for physical needs. So Johnny's got a broken arm, absolutely put a cast on it. Johnny's feeling extremely anxious or depressed, well, we'll deal with it at home. 
right? We'll take care of that ourselves. We just got to toughen up a little bit, right? Man up. We have all kinds of lovely sayings like that in honor cultures. All right, so what if you have a mental health need and you live in an honor culture and you get past this sense of stigmatization and you say, I'm going to get help. I'm going to take care of this. Well, can you? Well, not if these honor-related dynamics happen at more than just the individual personal level. If they happen at a broader social level, almost an institutional level, you might find, in fact, that honor states invest less in mental health care resources. And that is exactly what you find. Mental health expenditures per capita significantly lower in honor states versus dignity states. Number of mental health care practitioners per capita lower in honor states versus dignity states. Mental health organizations per million residents lower in honor states versus dignity states. So, so you see a perfect storm here. The pressures of living up to these standards of real masculinity and good femininity are intense. They are every day. They never go away because you, if something you have to earn is something that you can lose. You've got the pressures, you've got the possibility, you've got access to guns, you've got less mental health care, and even if it's there, you don't want to access it. So it really is the perfect storm of well-being. Let me, let me wrap up here with a couple of concluding thoughts here. You hear people say that humans are social creatures, and that's true, but so are ants, so are dolphins, right? What really distinguishes us from other social creatures is that we are fundamentally cultural creatures. We are cultural animals. We learn what it means to be a person of value from the people around us, from our society. And I know you think culture, that, that's the thing that other people have, right? Because you can see somebody else's culture, because it's something that sounds or looks or smells different from your own. But you and I have culture too. And it shapes us often in invisible ways that are hard to see and hard to feel, at least at a conscious level. But it is there. And any time we're studying social behavior, in any context, with any person, we are implicitly studying cultural forces. Honor is an example of one of those cultural forces that I think has profound effects on the human psyche, on how we experience life, on how uh, we relate to one another, so our internal lives and our external lives are all profoundly affected by these forces. Uh, I'm going to wrap up with that so we have a little time for Q&A. If you're curious about this and want to read more about it, in particular how it relates to life in the United States, you can read my book, which came out in paperback just recently, just in time for Father's Day, coming up around the corner. <laughs> Shameless plug there. Um, let me stop with that and take questions from the audience. Yes, in the back. Yeah, so there's a lot of things I would like to have mentioned. So I, uh, the question was, you didn't, you didn't mention religion very much. I, I mentioned it a couple times, controlling for it. Um, we actually have a, uh, an in-depth study on the link between honor and religion in the U.S. right now. What you see is virtually no link at all uh, with masculinity, with those masculine honor norms, with feminine honor norms, there is a modest but consistent association. So basically the answer is it depends on what you mean by honor, so which dimension we're talking about, and it depends on what you mean by religiosity. There's lots of different dimensions of religiosity. There's intrinsic religiosity, extrinsic religiosity, orthodoxy, fundamentalism, and the way in which you measure and categorize religiosity makes a difference here. But basically you think about these as two opposing ideologies, each claiming supremacy, right? So live by the honor code, live by a particular religious code, and in many religious traditions, these are going to be opposed to one another, right? Now, Islam might be a special case of that, but there are some data from another researcher from, uh, who's not from Jordan, but the research was done in Jordan where they found virtually no link between um, teenagers' endorsement of honor killings and, whether, and the extent to which that, that teenager grew up in a very religious home. Most of the religious homes were Islamic religious homes. Virtually no link at all. Now, the level of acceptance of honor killings was high, about 40% among boys, 20% among girls, so unacceptably high, right, as, a, as an extreme example of an honor-based dynamic, like what we see in the U.S. with domestic homicides, same phenomenon, right? But it was virtually unrelated to their degree of religiosity of their home. So there may be some connections, occasional points of synergy, but for the most part, they're opposing separate ideologies. Great question. Thank you for asking. Yes, sir.
Yes, absolutely. So can you measure this among individuals, not just categorizing where you're from? Absolutely, we do that. We have questionnaires that overtly ask you, do you believe in this? Do you believe in that? Um, we have questionnaires for masculinity and femininity. And, and not too long ago, we actually uh, created an, a measure of unconscious endorsement of honor-related beliefs. You, you hear about implicit bias, right? That comes out of social psychology for the most part. That's what we like to measure, that kind of stuff. It's very squirrely. It's very squishy, very hard to capture, but it has been done. We learned from research on implicit bias, mostly in the race and gender context, and created a measure of implicit honor endorsement. So it, so it gets down into the, into the subconscious. Um, but you can absolutely measure it simply with, with a questionnaire, for sure. Yes, sir? Right, so I think the key positive aspects of living in an honor culture go back to that idea of loyalty to your group. Why do honor cultures develop and thrive? They develop and thrive in places where there's nobody else you can count on. There's no strong state coming to your aid to protect you, defend you, and establish and defend the rule of law. And you don't have very much to even defend to begin with, right? Economic scarcity and absence of the rule of law are the key ingredients at a broad social level in, in developing and helping an honor culture to thrive. Absolutely. Again, these things stick around largely because they're inculcated through definitions of masculinity and femininity. But people who endorse, overtly endorse the beliefs and values of masculine honor and feminine honor, they really strongly value on, a, a loyalty to one's group, independent of specific honor dynamics. I think that's one of the main upsides of this. Loyalty matters, right? It really, really matters a lot. It may be life and death for you, if you live in a society that doesn't have the rule of law. Yeah, potentially. Yeah, well, there's not, we haven't found much of a link between actual income when we've looked at this at the individual or at the state level. But, but yes, I think in certain contexts, again, in a more extreme honor culture like, say, Afghanistan, not having honor, not displaying honor, means you're not going to get a job. No one will hire you. Everybody knows it. Everybody knows who you are. They know your reputation. You're not going to get a job. You're not going to get a wife if you're a man, right? If you're a woman, you're not going to get a husband. You may, in fact, be killed, right? So, there, again, that's the extreme side of that. We see a muted version of that in the United States, and, and loyalty is a really big upside of this. I, I referenced the paradox of politeness, too. Being from the South, having lived briefly in, in New England, I can tell you there's a big difference in politeness norms, and I missed it being in the North. Being in the South, everybody says, yes, ma'am, yes, sir, please, thank you. In Massachusetts, I loved living there, but it was really hard, right? <laughs> you're not really from here, Just go away, right? You, uh, it was a very different sort of place with different social norms, and I missed the politeness. Now, granted, that politeness is there, I think, functionally, to make sure we don't just kill each other all the time, right? <laughs> Establishing those rules to say, this is what you do and this is what you don't do, don't cross these lines. We're excessively polite, not consciously for this reason, but I think for this reason, because honor cultures in general are very polite cultures. They're very hospitable cultures. They have strong social norms to make sure that we don't cross that line, because once you cross it, there's no coming back, right? So there's kind of a darkness and light to this. Yes, ma'am, in the back. Uh, I haven't done that work at Rice. I've done it for many years at the University of Oklahoma, and the answer is no, not very much. Uh, a college education does not necessarily get to the heart of your definitions of masculinity and femininity. M most of the research, in fact, in the laboratory that, that I've talked about today and that's been done has been done with college students, educated people, again, mostly middle to upper class, because that's who college students are in this country. Uh, and so you see these dynamics, and I think it's important that you see these dynamics even in that stratum of society, right? And, and so far, I haven't seen much evidence that a college education changes that very much. It's deeply rooted in our social mythology. It's deeply rooted in our definitions of masculinity and femininity. That is not something that changes easily. It doesn't change quickly from generation to generation. It doesn't change within a generation just with, just with something like a college education. 
So it's, it's something that, that is, is so deeply rooted and fundamental uh, that it's hard to change. I think talking about it, making it more explicit, making it clear what are we talking about so we can take the good parts and keep them, take the bad parts and get rid of them. You can only do that when you're aware of this stuff, when you understand how it affects you and the people around you and directly address it. I think I'm out of time. I'd love to stick around and talk with people. Oh, I've got a couple minutes. We can take one more question. Yes. I never, I never end early. That's fantastic. Yes, ma'am. Absolutely. You see, so the, the comment here was, you, you see these honor-related themes in all kinds of social narratives, in movies, and books, and songs. Absolutely you do. In fact, a colleague of mine who's a developmental psychologist did a study a few years ago of, of themes in popular movies. We looked at the most popular movies of all time in the U.S. <clears throat> and we had some students who didn't know the purpose of the study code um, movie trailers for all of those movies for honor-related themes. And it was astounding how many of these extremely popular movies had honor themes running in them. Some of them were overt, some of them were more subtle. The, the single biggest category or genre of movie having these honor themes was children's movies. Right? Save the princess, be brave, somebody attacked you, what are you going to do? Right? I mean, they're a little more subtle, but they're extremely prevalent in children's movies. So. So with that in place, like how do you change these social norms? It's very hard to do because we're getting them from the time we're born. In fact, we get them before we're born because honor predicts how you name your children. Honor predicts whether or not you're going to use a patronym, a male family name, to name your sons. It does not predict anything about girls' names, right? Because in an honor culture, they are very patriarchal, and, and, and the patriarch of the family is the most important person and you're going to carry on the family name through your sons. There's actually, in some honor cultures, very strict naming practices that you're not really allowed to violate without a lot of stigmatization and getting in trouble with your family, right? So juniors and so-and-so the third and so-and-so the fourth, much more prevalent in honor states in the U.S. And after 9-11, it spiked in honor states, this use of patronyms for naming babies. It didn't go back down to normal till 2009. What was 9-11? It was a collective honor threat. Somebody attacked us. Even if you weren't personally attacked or personally directly affected, that's the nation's honor at risk. And honor dynamics, even in a subtle way like how we name our babies, changed after that. So it's deeply, deeply rooted. And it, and it crosses, it's culture, so it crosses everything. Everything that we do. It affects the way we feel. It affects the way we think. It affects subtle things like how we name our children. And that stuff is very hard to change because it's everywhere. It's like beach sand, right? You can't ever get rid of it. Or glitter, right? Never really goes away. It just changes place, right? It's like the laws of thermodynamics here. Do we have time for one more? Can we do one more? One more, yes. Now, that might be as a, so it, does traveling the world make a difference was, was the question. Um, it might. It might be the kind of person who does that sort of travel is the kind of person who's more self-reflective, more interested and open-minded and interested in other things. The, the thing about experiences like travel or education that you have to keep in mind is all by themselves, they may be fairly neutral, more neutral than we'd like to think, without sort of guided self-reflection. I had the privilege several years ago of taking some students from the University of Oklahoma to Scotland. And we did a, a, little, a little brief summer study abroad. Um, and, and they took a course on honor and violence from me and, a, and another course in the afternoons. Um, and, and it was a wonderful experience for exactly this reason, because most of these students had never left the state of Oklahoma, right? much less the country. And so it was wonderful in that sense. They got to experience another culture. And they got self-reflective moments where we talked about what do you see around you. Even today, by the way, Scotland, compared to England, Wales, has a higher rate of homicide, accidental death, suicide. Right? Even though I would say today, modern-day Scotland is less honor-oriented than Alabama, where I'm from. And yet you still see this residue, this cultural residue, this historical leftover in that country today. Right? 
So I think experiences are great, especially if they come hand in hand with guided self-reflection, where you're in very intentionally thinking about what have I experienced, what have I seen, what does that mean for me? Right, again, you might see, oh, look at all these strange cultural practices of all those people that have culture, right? And you forget, well, I have culture too. That's why these things seem strange. They're like accents. We think, oh, other people have accents, don't they? <laughs> I came to Rice as a freshman from Alabama, and I cannot tell you how much I was teased over my accent, right? I worked really hard on it, because in academia, you get looked down on if you sound like you're from the South. So I worked really hard. I don't have an accent anymore. Well, I went to Massachusetts and found out, yes, you do still have an accent. <laughs> but you don't hear it, right? You don't hear it. You hear it in other people, the way that they talk, the way that they express themselves. And you sort of, we think of ourselves implicitly as, I'm the norm, right? Everybody else is different. I don't have culture. Everybody else does. So, all right, I'm, I'm being given the signal. I must stop now, but I'd be happy to talk with more of you later. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Thank you, Dr. Brown. Let's give him one more round of applause for spending his lunch and afternoon with us. They want to know if you married the girl. Yes. <laughs> <laughs>